Hello and welcome. My name is Elise Hartman. I'm the Collective Learning and Resources Director at 313 Reads. 313 Reads is a coalition committed to working side by side in collective impact with citywide, statewide, and national partners toward literacy access, equity, and justice to support grade level reading. 313 Reads is dedicated to mobilizing alongside our community to ensure literacy equity so that all students are reading at grade level by the end of third grade. Thank you for joining us for today's professional development session, Research-Based Reading Instruction and Equity with Dr. Leah Van Bell, Dr. Julia B. Lindsay, and Dana Davidson. Dana is the Regional Director in Detroit and Southeast Michigan for the Center for Black Educator Development. Dr. Lindsay is the author of Reading Above the Fray, Reliable Research Routines for Developing Decoding Skills. And Leah Van Bell is the Executive Director of 313 Reads and President of the Michigan Reading Association. Leah, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm really grateful to be in this space. Um, uh, Julia was one of the keynotes at the recent Michigan Reading Association annual conference. So really excited to connect with you again here. Um, and Dana, with her work um, with Center for Black Educator Development, um, my son did a virtual um, Freedom School Literacy Academy through her organization. So I have such respect for both of you. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm a Detroiter. Um, my son goes to a public school here in Detroit. He's also received out of school literacy support um, from community based literacy programs. Um, and I'm here today because I really care about making sure that the folks who are doing amazing and powerful community based literacy work have access to what they need um, to have the tools in their tool belt um, to do that in ways that are going to have the most impact for our babies. So thanks, Lisa. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And Dr. Lindsay. Hi, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be with all of you today. Um, again, my name is Dr. Julia Lindsay, and I am a proud former elementary school teacher, as well as um, a former uh, colleague of those at the Center for Black Educator Development working around the Freedom Schools model. And I am also a former Michigander. Um, I went to the, uh, the University of Michigan where I got my PhD in literacy. And what I do is I talk about literacy and why it's so critical that we get these early foundations right um, and try to help teachers and community partners and leaders and parents get access to the information that they need to make sure that they can help all children have the highest level of literacy possible. So I'm thrilled to be here today to talk with all of you um, about how we can help out a lot of kids. Thank you so much. And how about you, Dana? Would you introduce yourself as well? Thank you, Elise. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me, Leah, and 313 Reads. Uh, I am a longtime educator, 26 years with the Detroit Public Schools. Absolutely loved it. Uh, I also am the co-creator and I was the chief administrator of Wolverine Pathways, the premier pipeline program at the University of Michigan. Had the pleasure of being an executive director for Mitch Album at Say Detroit Play Center. It's an out of school learning space that features reading and literacy as well as arts and athletics. And finally, now I'm here with the Center for Black Educator Development and helping children, particularly black children, achieve their academic highest so that they can make the world what they want it to be is a, a huge deal for me. I'm also the parent of two kids, uh, educated at Detroit Waldorf and Detroit Public Schools. So all that, thanks. Thank you. 313 Reads professional development sessions provide evidence-based and data-informed learning opportunities for educators, program leaders, and coalition partners. And I know that I'm looking forward to learning more about research-based reading instruction and equity. So Leah, the floor is yours. Thanks, Elise. Um, and today's tone will be pretty conversational, so really excited for folks to join us. Um, please, if you have questions or comments, um, drop them in, um, and we'd love to lift those up. And I love all the points of intersectionality. So I also got my PhD at U of M in the same program Julia did, and uh, Dana, your connection to U of M. Um, love it, absolutely. And I don't know if you saw Dana, but when we posted about this session, it was really amazing and lovely to see people posting, um, Chris Rutherford of um, Broadside Lotus Press posted that you were his daughter and Jari's favorite teacher. And Corinne Leon, who um, is very involved with MRA and also she leads our youth um, 
Literacy Justice Advisory Council um, just gushed about you. So it's really exciting to see all these points of intersectionality with people I know. I love it. Um, so I want to do a little bit of framing about 313 Reads because um, I think it was really easy to explain what um, sort of my job was or what the body of work that I was involved um, in was when I was a classroom teacher or a university professor. Um, and then to say to people like, oh, I'm with 313 Reads, this, this amazing space. But the, but the thing is, we don't serve children and families directly. We're a collective impact coalition, which means we convene folks who are serving children and families directly to help build aligned, coordinated efforts and also um, to grow impact. And one of the key levers for that is um, collective learning, professional development. And Elise champions that um, as the director in that space. Um, and you know, as I mentioned before, um, schools, uh, classroom teachers, deep, deep, deep respect for everything that they do. And 313 Read centers that and says, yes, and when here in Detroit, we have some zip codes with less than 4% of our babies reading at grade level, and we have an adult illiteracy rate in our community of 47%, it's a yes, and. Yes, schools are working so hard, teachers are moving mountains every day, and community needs to come together around this, right? So that's really important. Um, and at the heart of 303 Reads, this idea that literacy and access and equity and justice and liberation, like they're all intersectional, they're threads woven together in a tapestry and you can't sort of tug on one without tugging on the other. Um, so this book, um, Reading Above the Fray, uh, Julia, um, amazing book, and I hope everyone will, will read it. Um, it's a book that I tore through like in two sittings because it was just like, it's so good and compelling. And it's like, yes, yes. Um, but I think the thing that got me also really excited was you're one of the few folks I've seen who's making a really strong um, research-based argument for research-based reading instruction that is also culturally relevant, culturally sustaining, and centered on equity. And to see how you like wove that through, I was like, yes, this is what we need, because there's this idea that it's either or, right? So I was wondering if you could, I don't know, just start us off a little bit by talking about like, what is research-based reading? Um, because I think, you know, and you and I were talking about this the other day, there's a lot of debate lately about science of reading versus this. And, you know, we're not here to get into some battle about, you know, those kinds of dynamics. But what we do want to talk about is what do we mean when we say research-based reading? Could you unpack that a little bit? Absolutely. Yes. And I'll just show the book quickly. It's called Reading Above the Fray. Um, it's available everywhere books are, are sold. Um, and it was published by Scholastic. It is written mostly for educators, but I know that anyone could pick it up and take something away from it if they are supporting a child and learning to read. Um, if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're a community member, um, there might be certain sections that are feel less relevant, but my hope is that most folks could definitely mm -hmm. take away from it how reading works and how to support children at the earliest stages of reading and really getting the right skills that they need to succeed. Um, so you're absolutely right, Leah. There is a lot of conversation these days about how we teach reading and how to do it better. And one of the big threads in that conversation is trying to help many people, every stakeholder in reading education, have more access to what the research really says about what reading is, how it develops, and what we know about teaching it. Reading is actually one of the most well-researched topics in education. We have decades and decades and decades of research from psychology and neuroscience and education and sociology and all sorts of disciplines about reading because it's an, an incredibly interesting phenomenon. Um, it is not a natural process that humans develop. It's actually something that takes deep practice and actually requires us to almost rewire our brains, um, which is different than how we develop oral language and the ability to speak with one another. So it's a really complicated process that takes a lot of skill to support someone in developing it. And it takes a lot of skill as the one who's developing the ability to be a reader. 
Um, so right now, there's a great groundswell and excitement around trying to bring more research findings into classrooms. And I think this is really awesome and excited, exciting and it's much needed. Um, we all deserve to have greater access to what research can tell us about how to teach reading. And that goes all the way from what are the components that go into recognizing an individual word to what are the best instructional moves, materials and books to put in front of kids at different stages of reading to help them along the way to also recognizing that it's not just about the experimental evidence that we have around really specific practices, but also about the great depths of theory and qualitative research. So that's not necessarily numerically based, but based on observational data and other kinds of qualitative data that help us understand larger contexts about how children need to feel in their reading classroom and how children need to be uplifted in their reading classroom. So it's not just necessarily from my perspective about, you know, okay, here's how we can move this skill, but also how can we support a child in succeeding in as a reader who can then define their own destiny and in order to read and write and whatever they want for whatever purposes they deem um, exciting or useful. Mm -hmm. So right now there's a lot of recognition around this and it's exciting, um, but I do think it is also something, you know, to keep to be thinking about what research are people foregrounding and is there additional research that we need to lean into to make sure that we are meeting all of the goals that we have around equity as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, a couple things that you that you mentioned, um, Julia, is um, this idea of for them to use reading to accomplish things they want to accomplish, right? Like, and so often we get stuck in the conversation about, um, you know, our kids need to get to grade level reading and, um, you know, we frame it as uh, an achievement gap, right? And like, we know it's not an achievement gap. It's an access and opportunity gap. Um, and it's about so much more than just that grade level reading piece, right? It's about whole life outcomes and trajectories that are deeply linked to literacy, right? So um, yeah, so that, that really resonates with um, with the work of Three and Three Reads and, um, you know, and, and just personally thinking about, you know, myself as a parent and, you know, my son, uh, we're over on the east side, so not too far, Dan, from where your um, little humans went to school and thinking about, you know, why is it that kids living in our community um, should have less access to if I drive a few miles further east and I'm in Gross Point, right? And, and it's, it's a really different context. Um, you know, Dana, and I'm thinking so much about the work of Center for Black Educator Development and Freedom School Literacy Academy. Julia mentioned this idea that like all research isn't about these, like, you know, it's not all statistics and hierarchical linear modeling, right? It's, you know, qualitative research is also research and it's also really important. And I think sometimes we forget that things like culturally relevant and culturally sustaining pedagogy are research-based, right? It's a different kind of research than quantitative research, but they are, um, you know, research-based and um, just centering the importance of that. And I was just thinking about like when my um, son Langston was in Freedom School Literacy Academy and starting the, the day with um, uh, a, a calling together with djembes, with libations, with honoring ancestors. Like it was really powerful for my black son to be in a program that totally centered and affirmed him. So like, I would just love for you to share a little bit about Freedom School Literacy Academy and how you're centering this culturally sustaining work as at the heart of it. Thank you. Yeah. So um, for those who aren't familiar with Freedom School, it is a tradition of approaching literacy as the primary focus uh, for summer programming. And it builds the sense of community that is very deeply centered in the Black tradition, this understanding and knowing of Black people as brilliant folk, and this idea of storytelling and engaging uh, as a community effort. So it opens with breakfast and then what we call Harambe, which might be seen as a traditional, um, what's that morning gathering called? My mind just lost it. Harambe. Harambe. Uh, Harambe. Well, that's Harambe, but the traditional kind of Eurocentric word. Morning meeting. Morning meeting. Okay. Yeah. Morning meeting. Um, I can't think of it right now, but yes. But Harambe is, 
Uh, assembly, yes. And uh, Harambe is very deeply centered in the space of kineticism and blackness and culture and family and connectedness. And so that opens with a circle. Right. And it opens with a circle of storytelling, with a story, with the stories of cheers and chants, and then with an actual story read aloud by a member of the community to the circle group. And then we flow into a, a long literacy class that's woven with all sorts of activities and engagement with reading so that all morning our children get a sense of reading as this natural thread of storytelling that's connected with oral traditions, that's connected with movement, color, laughter, engagement, um, drawing, illustrating, and then deviating from the story, right? That there's no harm in that. In fact, there's richness in that. So Freedom School Literacy Academy uh, is running for the second summer here in Detroit. We're going to be at New Paradigm in Kip, Detroit. Uh, we're open for uh, enrollment very soon for little ones. And it's centered in that. Um, this idea that literacy is a part of you in many different threads, not just the printed word on the page, and that the printed word on the page is an extension of your engagement with story as, as a multifaceted endeavor. And that has a very um, African and indigenous people's um, history, right? Just this idea that storytelling is just how you get things known. Um, and so it feels less threatening and frightening for, for many children. As you're talking about that, um, I was thinking about in your book, Julia, like how many times you center and you'll have it in the main text and you have it again in the call out boxes. Like this is really important that um, although certainly code-based instruction is is critical, it's foundational. Um, you want a bumper sticker that says, I heart decoding on your Mazda sedan, I believe you said, um, that it shouldn't be the bulk of the instructional time. And you are advocating for some of these things that Dana, you're talking about, that it should be embedded in meaningful, social, purposeful literacy um, context. Yes, absolutely. I think sometimes we might hear the beautiful um, descriptions of freedom schools that Dana shares or that others share about other times of day or other instructional moments. And then we might hear about what happens in a phonics classroom um, that sounds really decontextualized and maybe kind of unrelated to other things. And we might assume that those have to be completely disconnected from one another, that there is no way to have any sort of overlap um, in those experiences. And I think that that's something that we really need to challenge, um, that assumption that these things are so disconnected. Because uh, for one thing, the experience that Dana is describing is one that is cultivated by teachers and um, others, educators who are deeply supported in their work and also who are deeply knowledgeable about their communities and their children and are really dedicated to um, giving children access to a particular type of education and to this culturally sustaining environment. That dedication should not go away because you need to enter into 30 minutes of direct instruction yeah, yeah. Um, around these code-based skills. And that that dedication doesn't need to go away just because something is a little bit more um, explicit than other types of day. So mm -hmm. some of the things that we know about phonics instruction and, and early reading instruction and foundational skills is that it does proceed in a much easier way for children and is more powerful when it is just direct and explicit and systematic. So it, that feels sometimes like it's disconnected from other things. But in fact, when we do it in a way that's research-based and we take our lead from research testing techniques, we can be pretty efficient and effective at supporting kids and getting exactly what they need while also then threading into more contextualized times mm -hmm. of day, supporting children in reading texts themselves that are connected to their own experiences and lives to new experiences and new learnings that they might be having to science, to social studies, to new interests that they're cultivating. And so we can really create connections throughout a day, even if we know that in order to give children the best access to literacy, some of that experience is going to be quite explicit. That doesn't need to take away from all of our other goals. And if 
If anything, I think it should add to them because we know that if we're giving kids our best instruction possible, we are making the most equitable move we can in our classroom because we're giving most kids the highest chance of reaching the highest level of literacy. Um, so I think if we if we view things in that direction instead mm -hmm. of um, putting things in separated circles mm -hmm. and saying, well, never, these two shall never meet. They have to be <laughs> completely different things. Um, I think we're doing a disservice to both ourselves and our children. Yeah. And, and I just think about so many times and I get where it's coming from. So I don't want it to be about teacher or school bashing, but I think it's this idea that there's a reader who's struggling. So they need more of this dosage of something. And often it's the, like the worksheet kinds of things. And so um, like I've often seen kids who then aren't part of the meaningful literacy activity because they're engaging in more of the paper-based worksheets. I'm not saying that I think worksheets are inherently evil, right? Like there is a, a, a space for that. Um, but, but it's just so different from being connected in some way to like a meaningful activity, right? And if, and if a little human is struggling, it doesn't mean that they need to um, have hours and hours of this kind of instruction. Um, but I love what you said about that if we're doing it in ways that are research-based and that are effective, um, that it's not this hugely time-consuming thing, right? Like, so to me, it's about if we know the tools, the research-based tools, and then we can mobilize them strategically, the instructional routines, the practices, um, it's not something that takes an excessive amount of time, right? Um, and I also love you um, talk about joy in the book and, you know, reading is the purpose of joy. And I think one thing that gets lost in the, the current, you know, reading debate um, and where folks stand on either side of that is this idea that if you implement research-based practices, that you're making reading sort of this mechanistic kind of thing. And you're like, no, 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 research-based, culturally relevant and joy, right? And it makes me think about you know, Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and this idea of like joy is a form of resistance. And it makes me think about, you know, Goldie Muhammad now, um, you know, calling us to to joy and literacy. And, um, you know, Dana, that's something that I certainly, you know, observed when my kids were doing um, Freedom School uh, Literacy Academy virtually um, during COVID, that, that piece of joy. Yeah, um, I am a more recent addition to the Center for Black Educator Development, so I missed its, its COVID experience, but um, I absolutely get what you're saying uh, around that piece. And then to expand it, uh, Julia, uh, from what you shared, I think that um, part of what happens is that we don't have enough folks who have the resources and the power to change what education looks like really investing in black and brown education and indigenous education in ways that are super duper impactful, which we could, right? We could decide that when we teach um, reading and math, right? Our focus is on reading in, in these communities where we see a struggle is occurring, we accept that the folk are brilliant and perfectly capable and we provide the resources to give it the best uh, setting possible. So there could be um, teacher's aides who are available in the classrooms, not one, but let's be magical, let's say three. And then that allows for small group instruction to happen every day. We can say, what if time doesn't matter in the traditional sense? And um, this is all the part of the day that's focused around literacy. And literacy looks like a lot of things. And there's you get to stretch your creativity, educators, right? There's research-based uh, instruction here around literacy. There's joy framed around. And you, as a professional, as an artist, as a dynamic, creative human being, you get to create classroom environments and days, right? Flow with those days that allow literacy to bloom in your classroom. Parents do that all the time. We read at different times for different reasons, sometimes to sometimes to humor, sometimes to distract, sometimes to put to sleep. That's okay, right? And children learn, wow, reading happens in all kinds of ways at all kinds of times, and I kind of like it or I love it. And we have taken that space away from educators, particularly educators serving Black, Brown, and Indigenous and poor children in this country, and we've really slammed on this regulation piece. And so 
I think that if we wanted to resource something like literacy in our communities in a rich and vibrant way, we could the same way uh, we can leap to give money for other issues um, that are less uh, protective and nurturing to our communities. It makes me think, Dana, like people will talk about like, oh, I'd like to do X, Y, and Z, but I'm so busy. I'm so busy. And I'm like, and we all make choices about our time, right? And we all make choices and schools make choices about what gets funded and how things get funded. Um, and I love that you're centering creativity, right? So not just joy, but creativity. And I think, you know, when I was a classroom teacher, um, I, it was a, it, at a time where, yes, there were, I was teaching to benchmarks and standards. And um, however, I had a lot of flexibility in the, in the journey I created to get my class there, my students there, and to evidence that learning. Um, and absolutely agree with you. And I'm sure you've seen this too, Julia, that very often in black, brown and indigenous communities, it's this idea like, well, kids aren't where they should be. We got to heavily script this curriculum and deprofessionalize teachers. And this is the thing that's going to get us where we need to be. Um, and one of the things I love, Julia, is that you say right from the beginning of every book, I'm not trying to sell you a curriculum, right? You're not trying to sell scripted lessons and the resources and the tools, the instructional routines, both in the book and that folks can download. I do think it's like adding to the tool belt that folks can use these creatively, strategically. Um, it it, um, it empowers, it like helps empower them. They're already empowered, but builds their empowerment as educators. And, um, you know, that I'm sure is a pretty intentional choice on your part because you could have done what some folks do and say, follow this script exactly. So I think it's interesting you made that choice. Yes, well, um, I actually taught at a school that was 100% scripted. We, um, every day I had a, a script like this thick <laughs> um, for the whole, whole day. And um, obviously there are times when that is really helpful, when you're fresh, out of college and you're stepping into a classroom, um, it can be really, really helpful, especially if you have a well uh, written and research aligned script because it helps you learn the cadence of a day and what might need to go into it. Um, and so I don't think that like scripts in and of themselves are always bad unless we are constrained to follow them exactly because we're humans, not robots. Um, yeah, but sometimes yeah. having that tool can be helpful as a way to kind of mm -hmm. understand, oh, this is how something can go. And mm -hmm. I'm going to try it a few times and then add my own mm -hmm. um, to this. But mm -hmm. My intention in reading above the fray is to help everyone who reads it get more access to actual research based understandings about how reading works and then some examples of how this works in reality in classrooms um, or in tutoring environments or in other organizations that are teaching reading uh, and so that you can take those things and it's curricular agnostic, no matter what curriculum you're using most of these things could be implemented into them um, and use those as a way to galvanize more research aligned practices. Um, but certainly, you know, there are obviously some universal truths about how learning works in the human brain, but there's also a lot about individuals that you, I cannot guess what every reader of this book's students look like, sound like, act like, are interested in, et cetera. And those are things that educators have to be able to act on um, of their own knowledge because no one's gonna know your students better than, than you and the community around them and the family around them. Um, so those folks need to be, you know, feel that power that they have to shape young readers' experiences in that way as well. Yeah, and it's, um, I was watching something recently where, and I'm horrible with names, so I forget her name, but she was um, giving sort of a, a little mini lesson on how to scat. And she first sang a song and she sang it sort of with the traditional melody and phrasing. And she said, you start with that. And then here's what it means to, to scat, to know where you're headed, but to, um, to improvise and to do it differently in different performances based on the feeling you want to evoke here and in different spaces. And I think that's so much around... Um, teaching and literacy instruction, right? That um, those lesson plans, those scripts can be really important. And like you said, Julia, um, I think about all my years as a professor of teacher education, it's really daunting and overwhelming to say, here's your classroom. Now prepare, um, you know, lesson plans for all day, every day, like from scratch, like, 
And I used to often say, people are getting a degree in teaching. They're not getting a degree in curriculum development. And it's kind of like someone's getting a dental degree, a dentist degree. I don't know what you call that. But, and then also saying, oh, and design the instruments you're going to use as a dentist. No, right? Like you're, you're becoming a master of this craft of dentistry. You don't need to also design all the instruments. And so, um, but it's just that idea that, um, you know, th not the hyper rigidity. So I just want to clarify, I'm not saying that I think like lesson plans or instructional routines are, you know, are, are not helpful. Well, um, and I appreciate you bringing that up because to circle back to that, I do think, I mean, we do have a lot of re research information on professional development and what really does it take to impact students when we give teachers um professional development and that sort of thing. And we know it can't be single faceted. You can't just say, here's the new curriculum. Everything mm -hmm. is going to be different now um, because that's not how that's not how we work as people. And so teachers and other educators deserve high quality professional learning along with any curriculum they do or do not also have access to. Mm -hmm. um, and ideally, they would also have access to a high quality curriculum from which they can um, change things to meet the circumstances and the children in front of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, I think that when I reflect on my own practice using a scripted curriculum, one of the things that really stands out to me is how many things in that curriculum I skipped because I didn't have the knowledge to know that mm -hmm. that was actually the most critical element of that. So mm -hmm. it didn't even matter that mm -hmm. I had this, this script because I was skipping parts of it yeah. that were actually <laughs> the most aligned with research. And yeah. so I think that there's this- um, You're doing the best you could at the time right. with the knowledge you had at the time, right? Right, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. But there's this sense that if that, that um, you know, okay, this, this script is gonna fix everything. And that's, I don't think that that's the case for oh. a multitude of reasons. Um, but if, if we really wanna give teachers and other educators what they really need, then we have to also lean into professional development along mm -hmm. with those materials and recognize um, not only the need for learning, but also mm -hmm. the need for autonomy. Because uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how many folks here have been <laughs> in a, like a kindergarten classroom, um, but there is undoubtedly gonna be something that happens that day that you literally could have never anticipated when you have 23 five-year-olds in front of you. Um, and the ability to majestically pivot is is the is something that incredible teachers do all the time. Um, and and they need the space to be able to do that as well. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm wondering if we can, um, we have been talking about community-based literacy, but also pivot a little more strongly that way because so right now we're trying to get an understanding of just sort of the landscape around like um, for our coalition, like what kinds of curricula are being used. Um, but talking with um, the team that's going to help us with that, you know, a lot of conversations about there's curriculum on the page and then there's lived curriculum. Right. And so I agree with you, Julia. Like, I, I think that. Um, that there are so many micro decisions that are happening in any lesson um, along the way that if we just look at the curriculum and say, yep, this, this is a, you know, as we always hear the stamp evidence-based curriculum um, aligns with science of reading. And then there you go. What we're not realizing is that teachers are not technicians that then just deliver that curriculum, right? Like, so it's all these decisions along the way. And that role of um, professional development. And in our coalition, there we have partners who, I mean, they're moving mountains every day for families, right? They're getting food to families. They're uh, getting diapers to families. They're doing family yoga. They're doing all kinds of um, family literacy programming, things um, that are just incredibly powerful, like 313 Speaks, which is about building early language um, with, uh, with a family-centered model. And you know, we have partners who in this work and have been serving family for generations say, we care about literacy. Like we care about this literacy access and equity gap. We want to do something. We want to include tutoring. That's amazing. Right. But it's also this space where like I have such deep respect and admiration and also building the trusting relationships together across the system to say yes. And, um, how can we learn together more about what kinds of things might happen in the tutoring to have more of the impact that you want to have? Right. So like I always say, like a caring adult, a book and a child like is not enough to make, you know, that that reading intervention have the impact. Like there are these 
practices, these research-based, these culturally sustaining practices that if we implement them, it's like, wow, like this can really support that impact. But what you named is really important. You know, you know, Dana and, and Center for Black Educator Development, and um, like they do this deep work around uh, training and building a teacher pipeline. And then I think about some community-based educators who I've been so grateful and humbled by their uh, candor and saying, um, look, I'm leading this reading program for my org now, care a lot about it. I've never had any training in literacy. I've never taught, but now I'm leading a literacy program. And so 303 Reads is really saying, okay, how can we come together and learn more about that? Um, Elise came, um, Elise has a, you know, Elise, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background in community literacy and just what has professional development looked like for you, I guess, broadly across that space, maybe not specific to one space, but I, there's just this huge access gap to folks who are doing community literacy and professional learning. Sure. Um, so my background was not in literacy and I'm not a formal, I don't have a formal education as a teacher. And it's something that um, I do come from this long line of teachers and principals and was always around um, conversations that were taking place around around conversation. And um, my mother was actually my kindergarten teacher and had a very long standing career um, as a teacher. And so I was always read to and was always reading and was an early reader. And that was something that I always had access to was was books. And so in terms of like professional development, it's something that I've had to really piece together and it's just come together by experiences and by doors just being opened for me and, and allowing me to come into spaces and to learn um, full, like through like full immersion, <laughs> you know, like just jumping in and being around people that are doing wonderful you know, jobs that are that are really excelling in this profession and uh, gleaning and just learning from them. And so to come into an environment where we are making this a priority, I've been on the other side of the table and I'm able to say, you know what, these are the things that I wish that I had access to or the things that I wish that I had known when I was tutoring and was, you know, in, in on, on that side of the table. So it's been a really interesting um, journey. But uh, yeah, so now it's been about 11 years, though, that I've been been doing this. So I've had some great opportunities. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I was thinking, Elise, as you were talking about that, um, my son is taking swimming lessons through Detroit Public Schools in a, in a local organization partnership over at Marcus Garvey by our house. And we had our first lesson and they were doing some assessments. And um, one of the parents walked up to the edge of the pool with a kid who was about four and I understand lots of different parenting choices and styles. I fully respect that. But threw her child in the pool and said, that's how you learn, right? And of course, the child was just hysterical. And the instructors were like, okay, but like here actually, we're, you know, we're not going to throw babies in pools. Um, but just that panic of that child, right? And just thinking about, um, you know, how often folks coming from a place of love and um, coming together as a community are like, I want to serve in this work. But like you're saying, at least sort of like not really having access to that learning, kind of, you know, cobbling, um, cobbling stuff together. And um, thinking about the long history, right, in Black and Brown and Indigenous communities when access to things has been denied, um, when there has been systemic historic oppression that communities say, okay, then you know we're going to do this for ourselves. And thinking about things like the Black Panthers and the impact they had on things that would become you know part of the, the school lunch program, right? That's now a national model. And um, just like how we come together to provide for community and babies. And you know, Dana, I think your program is really interesting too because you're in schools and you're working with teachers, but also with folks who haven't had that experience. So how do you? get them the tools they need to be able to implement research-based practices in this like really short window. What does that look like? Yeah, so that's actually a, a lovely question. Uh, we uh, use a model. So our goal is to rebuild the Black teacher pipeline with so many other uh, folk who are passionate about that in the country 
to that end, the way that our Freedom School Literacy Academy operates is we use, uh, like Freedom School, college students to be the lead educators in the space. Uh, high schoolers are their teaching assistants, and the classes are only of 10. So we're using 10 children. They're uh, rising first through third graders, and we focus on literacy. There is uh, two weeks of training that happens ahead of the summer program launching, and that's led by uh, well-researched and uh very reflective folk who've done deep work around that training. How do we, you know, share this with college students and this and high school students in this brief amount of time? We also have um, professional educators who receive the same training plus um, because they are going to be their mentors and coaches through this process of teaching literacy to little ones in our five-week program. So um, it is hours of work, but it is only across two weeks. Um, it is done with compassion and humor and lots of research and lots of practice and experience coming behind it. And it's done in layers. Uh, and then through those five weeks, they continue with uh, professional educators who observe them in the morning and then in the afternoon, while the little ones are enrichment programming, things like dance and visual arts, the college and high school students continue to get coaching. So although there's that first two weeks without children, there are the next five weeks daily that they continue to, to develop their skills and talk about what went well and what went wrong. And they're also peer mentoring each other uh, as they're in the spaces together with the coaches. You know, it just makes me think like there's so much research that points to professional development is not an inoculation model, right? It's not, boom, you got your vaccine, you're done, go forth and practice. It's this idea that like, yes, there's professional development, but when it's most effective, there's ongoing opportunities for coaching, for support, for mentoring, for continued learning, right? So one of our things that we say often in 313 Reads is we're all teachers and we're all learners. Like, I'm learning to every single day, right? Like I learned from reading Julia's book. I learned from Langston being in um, the program with Center for Black Educator Development. Um, and, and I think that's the space with our community-based um, literacy educators. It's honoring that they are literacy professionals, right? They may not have had um, that uh, education degree, but it doesn't mean that they can't be really competent, committed um, literacy educators. And, and Julia, I'm just wondering, like if you had to think about like the tool belt for a community literacy educator um, and thinking about like all the richness of your book, what are some things that you would prioritize as like, yes, as folks are training their teams, as we're working as a coalition to develop some coalition wide professional development, like, boy, here are some tools, you know, that folks want to have in that tool belt. Yeah, so I think that the most important thing around literacy would be to start at a position of making sure everybody gets um, some key information about how reading works. So that would be talking about things like the simple view of reading, which helps us understand that at its core, we can conceptualize reading as a combination of word recognition and language comprehension leading to reading comprehension. And there's a lot more nuance that we can add to that model and more updated research, but we can start by thinking about how are we supporting word recognition? How are we supporting language comprehension? And then how are we supporting those in a, in a united way? Um, and then I think it's also about being really careful and strategic about, okay, what is our purpose in any given tutoring session? If we are tutoring kindergartners and we are working along with their school environment to say by the end of the year, we want all of our kindergartners to know every letter in the alphabet and the sound that it most commonly represents and to be able to read regular three letter words. That might be a goal. Um, then thinking about what is happening in those tutoring sessions that's leading it to that goal. And are there things that might be taking away from that goal? So for example, in that tutoring program, are we spending tons and tons of time teaching children strategies to comprehend texts? Well, maybe that's not the goal of our tutoring program, so maybe that's not the best use of our time. It's not to say that's not a good goal, but it might not align with what we said we're trying to aim for. Um, and so thinking about really carefully, if you only have like 20, 30 minutes with children, 
you might not be able to hit every single goal, but what are the critical goals that you're trying to hit based on that child's needs and where they are developmentally? And then what are the moves that you're really making to enhance those goals? And then just to just circle back to earlier moments in our conversation, I also think it's critical to support community members in engaging in conversations about what does it look like to be culturally sustaining? What does it look like to be sustaining our community and our neighborhood? Um, what, what, what would that mean for me as an adult? And what would that mean I'm, I'm saying and doing with the child in front of me? And similarly, what would it mean to be uh, teaching even these discrete skills in a way that is informed by and sustaining the linguistic backgrounds of children mm -hmm. as well? So am I working with a child who knows how to speak multiple dialects of English? Am I working with a child who knows how to speak multiple languages or read multiple languages? And what might that mean about how I can create a different environment that supports them in realizing the power of all of those linguistic strengths and how they can leverage them in English reading or in Spanish reading um, or in understanding language at a broad level as well. I was excited. Um, so I um, worked um, deeply with Michigan Department of Ed um, for a year. Um, I left the university. I was kind of deciding where I wanted to land in community-based literacy. And I had this wonderful opportunity at Michigan Department of Ed to work around um, literacy educator preparation standards and also efforts to support a more diverse um, educator workforce. Um, and also shout out to Black Male Educators Alliance. I'm on their board. They're doing amazingly important work to help grow a more um, just equitable lane um, to support and retain um, Black Male Educators. But just thinking about um, when I was there, that changes in the educator preparation standards and the certification test that they take to center um, additive um, additive approaches to linguistic diversity. So instead of no bad wrong, um, to understand multilingualism, multidialectalism, like, you know, has a purpose, it's strategic to value that. And that's really interesting because I still find in our community you know, here in Detroit, here in other spaces serving, um, you know, often, you know, black, brown, indigenous children, that there's this sense like no, you know, still, you know, dialect variants that aren't more closely aligned with academic English um, are bad or wrong. And, you know, that's a whole other conversation um, because I also have to recognize, you know, my space as um, a white woman. Um, who you know is advocating for more additive approaches, but not you know being in the space of a member of the community. Um, sometimes folks making very strong arguments for subtractive models. So probably a whole other conversation. Um, but you know one of the things that you were um, also talking about was this idea of having a really clear purpose and. I don't know, I remember back in the days when there was such emphasis, well, and there still is in some spaces on like guided reading, right? Like you're a level M, get a little M, level M book. And it was like very incidental, right? And I, I just remember teachers literally pulling a book like, oh, they're a level M, leafing through the book going, okay, um, what do I teach with this book? Oh, like it's got quotation marks and dialogue. Okay, I'm going to teach quotation marks and dialogue, right? So they were choosing something from the book, but it was really incidental. And, and I was hoping we could make sure we made space today to talk about what it means to be explicit and systematic. Because um, I was actually at a birthday party this weekend with someone who's a fellow educator, and we had this really juicy conversation about, you know, which scope and sequence around phonetic elements. And I'm like, it, it doesn't matter, right? Like choose, there's lots of options, um, but as long as you're being explicit and systematic. So I'm wondering like if, if both of you could talk about, you know, how you think about that to make sure that that is systematic and not incidental in, um, in what gets taught. Yeah, sure. I'll start and then I'll throw it over to you, Dana. Um, so one of the strongest research findings we really have around foundational literacy is the need to be explicit and systematic in our teaching. So what does that mean? Well, explicitness means that we tell children exactly what they need to know um, and ideally in a concise and precise way. So instead of saying 
We're going to read a book called Bob's Ball, and we're going to try to figure out what sound does B represent, saying B spells the sound B. Now you say it. Now let's practice that. Now let's write a letter B. Now let's see a lot of letter Bs. And maybe we're at the stage where we start reading and writing words with B as well. But explicitness means we tell kids what they need to know. There is a time and a place for investigation, um, but it's not in these early stages of literacy. For one thing, because it is way faster to be explicit. For another thing, because we know different children are going to investigate things in different ways. And this isn't something where there's actually a whole lot of options. Um, letters can represent slightly different sounds depending on the dialect that you speak but they do represent a sound um, or many sounds, depending on the spelling. I, and we need to know what those are, even if we pronounce them a little bit different than the person beside us. The second part is this systematicity. And that means that we are covering all the aspects of a topic in a logical order. So in phonics, that means that we are going to make sure that we cover the vast majority of the common and some of the less common spellings and the sounds that they represent. So in say a, a early kindergarten, that would mean we want to make sure we go through all of the alphabet and we want to make sure that we extend a little bit beyond that as well. Um, but we don't want to start kindergarten, say, with teaching kids to read multisyllabic words because that wouldn't be logical. So if we look across the breadth of kindergarten through second grade or so, we're really seeing that we're covering many of the spellings that we see in written English so that kids are prepared to be able to read all kinds of words. And that flows into other aspects of foundational literacy as well. But at a broad level, what we're talking about when we say explicitness and systematicity is we're telling kids what they need to know, what they deserve to know about this weird printed thing that they have in front of them that to a two-year-old, to a three-year-old, to a four-year-old is bizarre. Um, and we're telling them what they need to know, giving them access to that information and doing it in a logical way that's giving them as mm -hmm. much information as we can give to them. Um, so that's that's kind of my view of, of this is that it's it's not um, it's not taking away from kids experience to tell them exactly what they need to know. It's adding to their experience. And we know from research that that is the best way to make sure that the highest percentage of kids gets this information and can do something with it, which after all is the whole goal here, is that kids can do something with this information, can read, can write, can text, can tweet, can TikTok, whatever they want to do, um, <laughs> but that they are able to actually do something with these skills. Great. Um, I loved all of that. And um... I also think that as a broader, like programmatic thing, the communication to the children, the educators and the parents and even the schools that we partner with, uh, that this is, this is our explicit work. This is a reading journey, a learning journey that we're on together, uh, that as you go through the daily um, systematic and specific things that Julia just talked about, and you look at the broader pieces of what the work is, I think the students and children feel empowered. I think that parents feel more empowered um, by this idea that you are communicative as the education community about, here's our focus for the day, here's our focus for the hour, here's our focus for the summer, and that this is a together thing. They feel more that they are with you in the journey and that they should have voice to respond to that journey. So I love the things that you shared, Julia, and because it's true. When we go ahead, we do it certainly at a more complex level for I, I taught uh, high school English. We say, this is our objective today. We're gonna work on metaphor. Mm -hmm. And now the, the students know, okay, there's gonna be a lot that happens in this story, but I wanna make sure I'm pulling metaphor out of it. And I understand that. Um, knowing that we're focusing on B, as the sound and B as the letter that represents it makes a child feel, okay, got it. <laughs> There's 25 other letters, but that one right there, uh -huh. that's my focus. So yeah, I love that. And just to add one more thing to that there, I think that there's a, a fear sometimes that that's going to be joyless, like we've kind of discussed. Okay. And I just want to okay. say that there is actually direct research on this. Researchers have manipulated the context that kids learn letters in, and they have actually seen in certain studies that kids are more engaged, mm. both by self-report and based on teacher observation, and they learn more in these decontextualized practice opportunities, not in 
just storybooks. And I don't mean that that's, that's not an anti storybook at mm -hmm. all. That means that if you're trying to teach the alphabet, don't be afraid to just teach the alphabet and then read a story later. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't need to necessarily try to force everything to be combined. And kids might actually like it more and be more excited and engaged and their learning outcomes could be even higher. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. <laughs> Okay. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And again, this is part of um, my experience um, and, and learning and being able to now take some of that. And, and when I go into these settings, you know, utilize what, what I'm hearing and, and learning. And I'm sure that there are people that are um, our literacy coalition members um, who are able to use this information as, as well. So thank you very much. And if you could just take a few minutes and give us a takeaway, how can people that are um, maybe do not have the formal education and are tutoring children and working with children, how can they take this information and utilize it in their practices? Can you both give us some, some um, pointers? I'll, I'll go first and say that we have a fantastic opportunity for college and high school students in particular to do just that this summer. I'm recruiting young people to be those uh, classroom instructors, and you will get a chance to impact young children's lives directly. They want young people teaching them and making reading come to life for them. So please see our website, the Center for Black Educator Development. The applications are open right now. You are needed. Awesome. And if you want to learn more about the specifics of these practices and more about foundational skills, um, I'm actually partnering with MAISA and Read Write Roar to be putting on a series of webinars open to all Michiganders who are educators, whether that's a tutor, a community member, a parent, a uh, formal educator in a school, and you will actually receive a free copy of the book as, as well as be able to join us in these four webinars specifically around how to teach some of these skills. Um, and this is totally free. So if you want to join us, the first one is actually this afternoon. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and drop the link for registration right now in the chat. Let me just pop this in. There is the link for the Black Educators Alliance, and then I'm going to drop the registration. And while Elise is doing that, um, I'll see you later for that, uh, Julia. I'm excited for that. And 303 Reads is really excited. Um, Elise shared this with um, everyone in our coalition and our network. And we will also be convening um, uh, after these sessions um, an additional gathering of community literacy folks here in our coalition to come together and unpack further and think about all this amazing stuff that we will have learned through this opportunity. Like, okay, and what does this mean, you know, for our work here in Detroit? And I love, love, love that again and again in your book, Julie, you say, and what are you going to do tomorrow, right? It's not six months from now, a year from now, when I finish some specific program, but like, now that I know this, what will I do tomorrow? So, uh, so I'm excited um, to be a part of this and we're eager for our coalition to be a part. Yep. And I'll be there this evening as well. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you both so much for, for joining us. And we have some additional information for our guests that can visit um, our website. So if you're listening and, and watching, you can go to our website for additional resources. You can sign up for our monthly newsletter and find more information about the 313 Reads Coalition. And you can also access all of our videos from our professional learning series on our Facebook page, as well as on YouTube. Thank you very much for joining us. Today's professional development session was made possible by both the Skillman Foundation and the United Way of Southeastern Michigan. Thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay and Dana for, for joining us. We really appreciated this and this was wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes, same here. Thanks so much for having me.